Welcome to this uh, NIS COPS webinar, Learning from COVID-19 Data in Wuhan, USA and Europe on Intervention Strategies. I'm pleased to uh, co-host this with, uh, with COPS and uh, the uh, program for our session today is uh, on the screen now. I'm pleased to say we had nearly a thousand register for this event. In a few minutes, I'll have uh, Ramar Mukherjee introduce our speaker, Shihan Lin. And um, I'm waiting a bit until everyone can register since we had a good turnout here. NIS at Penn State is uh, hosting this Zoom session and uh, Glenn Johnson and I are, will be monitoring the process. Attendees are view only. Please use the question and answer feature to ask questions during the webinar, but we will handle all the questions at the end and invite discussion at that point. When the speaker is uh, speaking, you will see her slides. And if you want to minimize the, the speaker uh, view, you can use the button, which appears at the top for many. At the end of this, presentation. There'll be a brief evaluation. Please fill that in with your feedback. And for those who can't stay for the whole time or couldn't make it today, we will post this on the NIST website within a day or two. And you will find that under the news item on the menu. With that, I am going to turn this over to Brahma Mukherjee, and she is the chair of Biostatistics at the University of Michigan and also the chair of COPS. So, um, Ramar, open, uh, it's, it's all yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jim. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining for this special NIST COPS webinar presented by Professor Shi Hong Lin from the Department of Biostatistics and Statistics at Harvard University. She is going to share her groundbreaking research on the COVID-19 global pandemic. As was mentioned, I am moderating this session in my role as the chair for the Committee of Presidents of Statistical Societies, or COPS. Ji Hong has had a close relationship with COPS as the past president uh, from 2010 to 2012. And I had the pleasure of serving as her assistant as a secretary, and we became great friends. Shi Hong has numerous awards and accolades in the profession. Anything that you name, you can name, she has won it. Shi Hong is an elected member of the National Academy of Medicine, recipient of the Mortimer Spiegelman Award from the APHA, Committee of uh, Presidents of Statistics Presidents Award, as well as the COPS F. N. David Award. Shi Hong is a fellow of the American Statistical Association, Institute of Mathematical Statistics, and international statistical institutes. We all know that Shi Hong's statistical methodological research it has been in the area of correlated data, kernel methods, statistical genetics, and biobank research. Uh, the research has been supported by numerous grants, uh, in particular, the very coveted Merit Award and the Outstanding Investigator Award from the NIH. But today, her lecture is going to be on a different topic. It's, it's titled Learning from COVID-19 Data in Wuhan, USA, and Europe on Intervention Strategies. Uh, this is a wonderful narrative, and I'm going to give you a brief background that she provided how this work began. Shi Hong started collaborating with a few faculty members at the Tongji School of Public Health of Huazong Science and Technology University on the analysis of Wuhan COVID-19 case data in late February. The team analyzed about 32,000 cases and the paper was just published in JAMA on April 8th. The preprint, the published paper, the talks, and the implications of these findings have attracted significant attention in the scientific community and in the society in general. With a very wide media coverage and interviews, uh, including CBS, uh, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Telegraph, Nature News, National Academy of Medicine, including a testimony in the UK Parliament's Science and Technology Committee. 
Shi Hong has been involved in a range of other COVID-19 related activities, such as serving on the state COVID-19 task force to help Governor Baker develop the state plans for combating COVID-19. And she's also serving as the PI of the How We Feel project, which is an symptoms and health status app. This app has more than 500,000 users and 3.5 million responses. Today, we have gathered from all over the world to hear Professor Shi Hong Lin's narrative that has influenced policy and human health. Shi Hong, it's an honor for NIS and COPS, and I look forward to hearing your lecture at this defining moment for our species. The Zoom screen is all yours. And thanks so much, um, Amar and Jim, for uh, the invitation and also for the very, very kind and the introduction. And it's such a great honor to share with you some of the work we have been doing in the last uh, two months. So maybe I gave you a little bit, bit background and uh, so where this talk come from. So this talk was initiated by the invitation from Winner. And so I would like to first thank the winner for this initiative and also thanks uh, CAFS and the NIS uh, for, uh, uh, for joining the force and uh, for inviting me to give this talk. Um, so, um, uh, so I would like to uh, tell you a little bit about what we learned uh, from Wuhan and US and also the Europe data. And in particular discuss the public health intervention. So as you know, on March 11th, WHO declares a COVID-19 outbreak as a pandemic. So um, this virus has made a huge um, influence on the whole world. So as you see from this data, there's a huge number of unemployment rate in US and the, uh, in April compared to many, many months uh, before that, and also uh, compared to the last 20 years data. And also this has, um, this epidemic has a huge impact on the scientific communities and as you know, almost all the small, large conferences has been canceled, and many of us have work at home. So this figure shows you the number of infected cases and also the number of deaths in many different countries and in the world. So overall, there are about 4.2 million COVID-19 cases. And uh, so if you look um, from the figure on the left, and then you can see that the number of cases uh, right now uh, in US um, is uh, the highest compared to the other countries. And uh, so the, uh, followed by the by UK and uh, several other countries. And uh, on the right, this is a number of deaths. And as, uh, again, as you can see that, um, the, the number of deaths in US is the highest uh, compared to the other countries. And so here the three countries were highlighted, US and UK and also China. So as you can see that because China's um, was uh, uh, ahead of uh, the, the other countries for about two months. And so you can see the number of cases and also the number of deaths. And uh, so they are doing really well both in terms of the reduction of number of cases and also the number of deaths, COVID-19 related deaths. So, so those data showed there is a huge multifaceted impact. And uh, so, uh, so what I would like to do is to share with you some of the analysis and we have done using the Wuhan data, US data, and also the Europe and other countries data. So uh, by learning from the data that can provide us about a potential um, knowledge and also use the knowledge and to convert them into the strategies and the, what we can have to help fight this uh, terrible virus. 
So I first started working on uh, COVID-19 research in late uh, February, and by collaborating with colleague at Tongji School Public Health in Zhonghua Zhong Science and Technology University in Wuhan. So we analyzed the 26,000 COVID-19 cases in Wuhan and in late February. And so in order to share the knowledge with the scientific community and the world uh, as soon as possible, and uh, we posted the um, preprint immediately after we finished the analysis. So we basically wrote the whole paper in about 10 days. And so this paper was posted on uh, Met Archive on March 6. So we analyzed the data from the January, January 1 to February 18th. And so this paper received a uh, lot of attention and uh, since it was posted and I twisted the major findings and uh, on March 6 as well. So as you can see that the abstract was viewed by almost 120,000 um, people and also the, the PDF file was downloaded by uh, 46,000 uh, people. So at first, I would like to acknowledge my co-authors at uh, the uh, Tongji School Public Health. And uh, so An Pan and uh, Chao Long Wang and uh, Li Liu, they are formal uh, SPH alums, so I'll highlight them. And the, uh, the last author, and uh, Tai Chun uh, Wu, is the dean of Tongji School Public Health. So I want to thank all of them for their tireless effort and that work for finishing this manuscript in a very short time. And especially many of them were quarantined and at home. And so the hope was the gained knowledge could benefit US and other countries at this critical time. And then the part one of this paper was uh, published in JAMA on April 10. And so we updated the analysis in the JAMA paper by analyzing additional few thousand cases. So totally the total number of cases we analyzed uh, uh, published in the JAMA paper were 32,000 cases until February 8. And so this paper since was published in JAMA also received a lot of attention. And so as you can see that over 113,000 viewers of the papers and also this uh, uh, um measures and uh, uh, is about the top 0.01% of the 15 million articles in that database. And so as Bamara mentioned, and to share the, um, the, the, the knowledge and uh, with the uh, general communities, and uh, I was invited to testify and uh, in the evidence session of the Science and Technology uh, Committee of UK Parliament on April 17th, that committee consists of eight uh, parliament members. And also, as Barbara mentioned, and the work and interview that happened in uh, lots of uh, medias, and uh, so um, in both the in US and also in um, in UK. So this probably is the most important slide that summarizes the major findings. And so I'll present mainly uh, uh, based on the. Um, my archive paper, then later on, I'll update the result using the um, JAMA paper. So it can give you some historical perspective. And so in the Met archive paper, we analyzed 26,000 cases until February 18th. And so we divide the data into uh, uh, four, uh, uh, into four periods. And uh, so that before January 23rd, that was the period without intervention. So as you can see in this figure, the number of cases went up quickly. And so we estimated this uh, R, this is called a effective reproductive number. So that measures the average number of people infected by a case at 3.8. So what that means is on average that one infected case infect another uh, three to four um, people. And so you can see this virus, this disease is very, very infectious. And then on January 23rd, the city was locked down and then the social distancing measure, measure was launched. So you can see the R value dropped dramatically from 3.8 to about 
So that means one case still infect another one person roughly. And then after February 1, and then the city launched a cause a centralized quarantine and isolation. And I'll explain what that means. And so by adding this measure to um, social distancing, then you can see the, the curve bended very quickly and the R value dropped very quickly to uh, 0.32. So uh, so I'll give you a little historical uh, background of the, the outbreak. So Wuhan is located in the central part of China. So it has a population size of 11 million. It is a beautiful city, as you can see in the picture on the left. And there is a river called the Changjiang River. And so this is the most well-known river in, in China. It runs, go through the, uh, go through the whole country. And uh, so it also goes through the Wuhan. On the right, and uh, so this is the East Lake. And uh, so it's a beautiful lake in Wuhan. So every um, marsh and it has beautiful cherry blossom. So in this beautiful city, something happened on December 8th. And so the first case and was a COVID-19 case and was detected um, close to Wuhan seafood market. So this is a picture of the Wuhan Huanan um, seafood market. And this market was closed on January 1. And uh, so on January 11th, and that was the start of the spring, fest, uh, spring uh, festival travel. So the massive um, human movement and happened during this period. So lots of people um, left the city, went to visit their family. And uh, so um, because the number of cases uh, went up quickly and during this period, and then the city started the lockdown on January 23rd. And then all the, there was a traffic ban and all the uh, train travel and also air travel was stopped. So due to a very large number of cases, the healthcare system and basically was crashed and it was under new, new, uh, enormous pressure. So there was overwhelming shortage of medical resources and um, so that resulting in many patients not able to receive medical care. To address this serious shortage of medical resources and the two new hospitals, those are very simple hospital, were built in two weeks and also 16 field hospitals and by converting the stadium and exist Exhibition centers and uh, were um, uh, launched. And also, uh, many university uh, dorms and also hotels um, were converted and uh, for additional beds for suspected cases and also uh, close contact to isolate them. And also uh, many healthcare workers, almost about 30,000 healthcare workers across China want to help Wuhan. So this is just a quick um, uh, summary of the estimated R values. And we use the extended share model and in the Met Archive uh, preprint. So before the uh, January 23rd, there was no intervention. You can see the R value was quite high. And after launching the social distancing, you can see the R value drop dramatically, just a little before one, above one. Then after launching the, the uh, centralized quarantine, then the R value dropped very quickly and was estimated about 0.3. So in order to fit this model, multiple assumptions were made. So for example, we assume the incubation period as 5.2 and the infection period was 2.3. So those were, the um, available in the literature, but now with the new data and the estimated incubation period and the infection period is, is, um, is ex expected to be uh, shorter. And also the, uh, we assume the number of uncertained cases and is the same as uncertained cases. So we only analyze the lab confirmed uh, infected cases. So we did a nice sensitivity analysis and the results were similar. 
So I'll quickly summarize uh, the, the result. So we, for the first two periods, that is the period before January 23rd, so as you recall, uh, the estimated R values and uh, was about um, 3.8. Uh, so this blue curve is the projected number of infected cases if no intervention um, happened. So then you can see that this number will go up uh, very quickly if no intervention happened. And uh, so for the um, third period, that is the period of the lockdown. And so you can see the R value dropped dramatically and uh, um, the R value was about 1.25. So if the, this intervention, the social distancing intervention continued, and then this is a, a projected blue curve. And so you can see the number of infected cases uh, still go up but it's much slower rate compared to no intervention. And so this estimated R values and about one using the social distancing and was replicated in uh, many countries and afterwards. And so what that tell us is the social distancing definitely help and helping reducing the R and uh, to close to one. So if you look at the Italy data, so this is a curve, estimate R curve between February 17 and to April 13. Then you can see the R value has been stuck around one for over a month in Italy. Similarly, and this is a curve for Germany. So you can see this is a curve from March 8 to April 6. And so you can see the R value again has been stuck around one. So what that tell us is the social distancing definitely help significantly reducing the R and the, by flattening the curve and the, to be around one, but it's not enough. So it's important to bend the curve to stop the outbreak. So basically this is a take home message number one. So social distancing greatly help um, flattening the curve, but was not good enough. So because the social distancing help block community transmissions, so basically reduce the between household, between household transmission. However, family transmission is common. So the infected cases may still infect a family member and close contact. And so what that means is we need to do more than social distancing. And so, the, so in other words, social distancing help reduce R to be around the one, but it was not good enough. So if one look at the US data and the similar result is observed, and basically the US curve is around one, I'll show that to you later on. So, you, um, so the family transmission is common. So this is, can, can be seen using this um, New York article, uh, New York Times article published in, um, uh, in March. And so in this uh, article, seven family members were infected and uh, four of them were died. So it's critical to develop strategy to prevent family, within family transmission. So that uh, to protect the family members. So let me now tell you a little bit about um, uh, the How We Feel project. Then um, the How We Feel project, this is an app um, for uh, letting participants report COVID-19 symptoms and health status. So we launched this app on April 4. So this is a joint effort um, the, so, uh, with, uh, with uh, Feng Zhang and, uh, at the Broad Institute. Feng is most well known for CRISPR technology and Ben Superman at Ping, um, Ping is Interest. And uh, so he's the CEO at uh, Ping Interest. And uh, so um, Feng and Ben was the initiator of the, this uh, project. So I joined force with them. And so, so far, we had over half a million users and over 3.5 million, 3.5 million, uh, sorry, we have about half a million users and 3.5 million responses. And uh, so the, in collaboration with the international team, and we also launched a consortia, we called the uh, uh, consortia called uh, Coronavirus Census Collective. So uh, by uh, leveraging the, um, 
those surveys across many different countries. And so this uh, can show share um, uh, articles and uh, will appear in Nature Medicine. So this is just one example of the use case of the how we feel. So we have been analyzed and uh, we have been doing many, many different analysis and this is just one example. And in this particular context, so we estimated the number of the infected subjects in the household without an infected person and also in the household with at least one infected person. So you can see that in the household without infected person, a person about less than um, less than ten percent of people were infected. Um, the the probability on a person being infected and the, in um, the household without any infected persons is less than ten percent. And so in the household with at least one person being infected, then you can see the chance of being infected is uh, uh, just a little before below fifty percent. So by adjusting for the other covariates and the, then we can see the risk of uh, household transmission is, uh, uh, the as ratio is quite high, it's over 10. So what that tell us is household and the congregate um, place transmission is common and need to be blocked. So the household here is broadly defined. Um, the, so, that, uh, so this including the uh, people living um, the uh, so living in the same household, and also uh, it's important to consider the um, uh, close space as well. So such as the um, uh, nursing homes and uh, the homeless shelters, because in those places, and because people live in the same under the same roof, and so as you heard that many of the trans uh, uh, the long term care facility has a high risk of transmission. So therefore the um, when we consider the prevention, it's important to help reduce the within household transmission and also the transmission, reduce the transmission in the congregate places such as a nursing home and also the um, homeless shelters and also the uh, law enforcement uh, uh, facilities such as a prison. Okay, so what that tell us is the Social distancing definitely help, but it's not good enough. And uh, so in order to bend the curve, and uh, one need to do more. So the Wuhan strategy, Wuhan realized this issue. So after one and a half week of social distancing, they launched the centralized quarantine on February 1. So you can see the R curve and the R value dropped quickly, and it, we estimated R as a 0.3. And so this blue trajectory indicate if this uh, centralized quarantine and con strategy continue, and uh, then uh, what is the projected number of cases, then you can see that meet uh, the uh, observed case uh, curve very well. Chi Hong? Yes. Uh, there are a few questions about this curve. So maybe it is a good point to clarify those, if that's okay. Sure. If we could go back to the previous slide. Sure. Yes, so, so uh, there are some questions from the audience which is asking that, um, what is this, why is the sensitivity of the curve around February 1? And what is the difference between the social distancing? What did that constitute? And what is centralized quarantine? What kind of measures and how do they differ? And how do you feel about how long does it take for these measures to take, have an effect? Yes, that's a very good question. I'm glad somebody asked this uh, outlier question. And uh, so this outlier um, uh, was um, uh, due to the administration, administrative um, operation. The reason is because the um, um, field hospital was launched on February 1, and the medical staff was really busy and admitting the patient into the field hospital. So they didn't have enough time to record the exact date of the, um, of the, um, uh, the, uh, the positive test. And uh, so therefore they just recorded the February one. So the true infection, uh, true, um, uh, positive, um, uh, the true positive test date is likely to be before. Uh, uh, before uh, February 1, probably a week before, uh, during that period, a week before, uh, in that one week period window. 
And so we did a multiple sensitivity analysis, and uh, so uh, the results are similar. And uh, so this is an informative outlier and it should not be removed. And uh, so in terms of how long the social distancing should last, and then as you can see that by looking at the um, Italy data, you can see by looking at the Italy and the Germany data, then you can see that if one continues social distancing, and so they have been doing the social distancing for a while, and then you can see the curve um, basically got stuck at one. Mm -hmm. And uh, so for both the Italy and also for Germany. Yes. Yeah. Any others? No, I think just quick uh, clarifying what is the difference between the social distancing measures that Wuhan was adopting and what, what is additional in centralized quarantine. Yes, and I'm going to explain what the centralized quarantine is. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Okay. So um, we updated this analysis using the 32,000 cases until March 8. And so this paper was published in JAMA. And so in this paper, we use a more non-parametric estimation of the curve. And so you can see that um, this is estimated R curve on the right. And so uh, instead of estimating the R curve using the discrete value, and we use this uh, uh, IP estimate. Um, method and estimate the curve continuously. And so as you can see that, and then the curve uh, uh, became uh, below one on February 6th. And because there is a definitely, there is um, um, the, the lag effect. And uh, then um, on March 8th, the estimate R value is about 0.1 and almost close to zero. Uh, okay, so in order to explain the, uh, how the centralized quarantine or isolation help. So let me ex give you some intuition. So, so basically the key idea is the, in order to out stop uh, the centralized um, court isolation and quarantine basically means is central, uh, isolate the infected subject and the, in the field hospitals and also quarantine the suspected cases and close contact in the hotels and with the university dorms and with medical care provided. And so, so basically, if in order to stop the outbreak, so basically one important uh, one need to do is to reduce the number of new infections. And then in order to reduce the number of new infection, basically one need to control the source of infection. So how, uh, so, so on the left, that basically uh, is a cartoon indicate, uh, showing the home quarantine, and basically shows uh, the, the social distancing. So you can see this, right, there are three communities. The red indicate infected in that cases, and blue indicate infected family member and close contact and the community members. And so you can see that uh, home quarantine definitely help reduce the community um, transmission. But the family members and uh, they are still those marked in blue and uh, they are still at risk of being infected. So the centralized uh, quarantine and or the isolation idea and isolation basically means that take the infected case out of the network. And by taking them, those, so you can see those red triangle is marked by white triangle. Now it's basically take them out of the network. By taking them out of the network, basically admitting them to the field hospitals in Wuhan, and then the family members and close contact were protected. And so they were not infected in this cartoon. So how did that work in Wuhan? And so the um, centralized quarantine here means centralized isolation quarantine. And the standard isolation refers to the infected subjects. So that means isolate those infected subjects by admitting them to the field hospitals. And uh, those include the mild cases. So this, is a, this operation is different from what US uh, does. So in the US, the, the only the severe cases were admitted hospital, admitted to the hospital, including the uh, uh, field hospitals. And uh, so in Wuhan, the mild cases were admitted to the field hospital. So, if any of those became severe and those mild 
cases were monitored. If any of them became severe, and then they were transported to the regular um, ICU immediately. So the second group is the suspected cases, those cases with a symptom, but they may not have had a test yet because at that time there was a lack, uh, there was a shortage of testing kits. So those cases were quarantined in the designated, designated hotel. So, and also the third group is those cases uh, with uh, those subjects with um, fever. And so they may not be a case. And uh, so they were quarantined as the designated hotel. The fourth group is the close contact. And also they were also quarantined in the hotel or university dorm. So in those three places, and the children uh, stay with the family, um, stay with the parents. So younger children stay in the same room as the parents, and older children have their, uh, their own room. So, and also uh, medical staff were on site. Any of them, for group two to three, any of them had, um, was tested positive, and then they were transferred to the field hospital. If any of them had no symptom, uh, if any of them and um, was tested in after 14 days and as a negative test, and then they went home. So the take home message number two is by adding centralized isolation and quarantine to social distancing that help bend the curve and stop the outbreak in Wuhan. So the, 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 what social distancing does is, is complementary to um, uh, centralized isolation and quarantine. Social distancing help block the community transmission that is within household, uh, that is between household transmission. Centralized isolation and quarantine help block within household transmission. So basically prevent infected cases from infecting loved ones. And also patients receive medical cares and the mild cases, they receive medical care, medical care immediately. So that help prevent the, uh, them from progressing to severe cases and also reduce the chance of becoming severe. This also help monitor the patients. And uh, so if any of them became a severe and then the, uh, the patient was transferred to ICU immediately. This also helped reduce the burdens of uh, the healthcare system and also ICUs. And because the mild cases were admitted to the field hospitals. And so therefore the, 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 uh, the patient and the uh, uh, medical staff ratio is higher compared to the regular hospitals. So that reduced the, relieve the enormous pressure on the healthcare system, such as the lack of ICU capacity and the shortage of PPEs. So the, all the 16 field hospitals in Wuhan were closed on March 10. And so they closed, uh, they cleared all the patients. And so the, on the right, this was the closing ceremony. And uh, then um, on March 18, no confirmed case in Wuhan and was identified. On April 8, um, the, the, the Wuhan reopened the city after two weeks of no um, confirmed cases. So I'm going to explain, I want to emphasize here, we emphasize the confirmed cases. Those were the cases we analyzed. Later, I'm going to talk about the uh, asymptomatic and uh, pre-symptomatic cases. So I would like to thank and all the citizens in Wuhan and also the local healthcare workers and also the 30,000 um, plus healthcare workers across the country who went to help Wuhan and for their in, uh, tremendous sacrifice and effort. So they are really uh, the, our heroes. So here also summarize the major epidemiological characteristics of those uh, 32 uh, life confirmed cases analyzed uh, in uh, the Wuhan data. I'm also going to connect that with uh, how the data look like in the US. So on the left, this is the infection rate and uh, by connecting the number of cases on the, with the census data in Wuhan. So as you can see that um, within each period, 
and the elderly have much higher infection rate and compared to the younger group. And the children have a very low uh, risk and uh, compared to the adults. And uh, so in the third, uh, uh, in the third period, and then this, uh, you can see the infection rate uh, among uh, the, uh, is the highest. And uh, also the uh, elderly have the highest uh, risk of infection. On the right, this is Massachusetts data and uh, downloaded from MA website. So because the early warnings of the need to protect elderly, then you can see that the elderly for age 60 and 70 years old, their risk is not much higher compared to the uh, younger age group. Because as you recall, in the early days, and there was a lot of calls for protecting the elderly. And for example, like grocery stores can only allow elderly to shop and between seven and eight. So that helped a lot. And so the highest risk group is the 80 years above a group. Then you can see their risk of infection is much higher compared to the other age groups. And also, um, we, uh, we studied the infection rate by gender, healthcare workers, and also using the US data, we look at the essential workers as well. So on the left, this is the Wuhan result for each period. This is the infection rate for each period. You can see men and women have, based on the Wuhan data, have a similar infection rate. Healthcare workers, those only include the local healthcare workers. And the, the, their infection rate and the, before uh, February 1 was much higher compared to the general public. So multiple reasons. One is there was a, a lack of PPEs and also there's a, a, a less awareness of the infection. So after February 1, this is where the, after the field hospital was launched, then you can see the infection rate of healthcare, local healthcare worker is much uh, better compared to before, but still higher than the general public. So on the right, this is the result of um, using the how we feel um, data. So you can see this is a, a logistic regression result. So you can see the house, uh, healthcare workers have a, uh, um, this is on the log as ratio scale. Then you can see healthcare worker have a much higher risk of infection, and also the essential worker, especially the first reporters, uh, uh, responders, and they have a much higher risk of infection compared to the general public. And so the third take-home message is it's important to protect healthcare workers with comprehensive PPEs, and so those include the mask, a protection suit and the medical goggles and the uh, cap and um, face shield and also uh, multiple gloves. And also it's important to provide them the training and how to put on and uh, take off the PPEs. And so as you know, there's still a, a shortage of PPEs. So I give um, this, um, this is my, let me see, this is my uh, fourth uh, public talk. The first talk I give was on March 13. So in March 13, I gave a talk at the School of Public Health. And uh, then um, at that talk, so I showed the audience uh, three pictures. And the one is the, based on the Wuhan result, I sh showed the healthcare worker, local healthcare worker was at much higher risk of infection. And so you, I showed them a picture of one news article the day before from ABC News that what the uh, that shows the healthcare workers and transporting a patient to uh, um, uh, the ambulance and so they did not have the uh, full protection suit they did not have the um, the uh, the they only have the mask and they did not have the the hat they did not have face shield and also no goggle and uh, and uh, so um, then um, they showed another picture. Uh, this is uh, basically the picture on the on the, uh, the on the left. This is the top picture. On the right, uh, on the left, then this how the what kind of a PPE is a China healthcare worker wear. And so it's, I did not expect those slides was widely distributed over the weekend. And uh, so uh, then on March 3rd, 16, and uh, so there was a launch of this champagne for uh, calling for help 
for providing PPE to the healthcare workers. So, so these national champions happen in the following week. And uh, so it's really speak for the, I got a lot of emails from the healthcare workers during, uh, during that time windows. And uh, so this, this really speak for the power of the data. So the second point I want to make is um, the is another uh, uh, vulnerable group and uh, is the health, um, is the uh, low income and also the uh, uh, URMs. So the COVID nineteen and brought up an important issue we all need to um, think about. This is a health disparity. So this figure shows the top seven. Um, towns in Massachusetts, which has the highest infection rate. And so the, the top seven towns are all low income towns with a high percentage of URMs. So this basically brings up the take home message number four. So that is to protect the five vulnerable groups. Those include healthcare workers, elderly, and, um, and the family members, and the close contacts of infected cases and essential workers, including those workers uh, working in the healthcare facilities and, and long term healthcare facilities. And also, the last one is the low income family, especially those underrepresented minorities, because generally they, um, those neighborhoods have uh, poor housing conditions. And also, the parents need to go back to work. And so, therefore, the social distancing and also uh, isolation, home quarantine are much harder for them. And so, one colleague mentioned to me the other day that um, the social distancing is a privilege. I think what that colleague said was true. I think it's harder for those low income families and underrepresented minorities. So, they need, they need to be protected. Um, so uh, the next is I show you the severity factors, uh, risk factors. So as you can see on the left, that um, um, elderly and have much higher risk of um, infection uh, of um, becoming severe. So you can see that for the 60 to 70 years old, their risk of becoming severe is three, as relative risk about three, and the 80 years older and the relative risk is about six compared to 20 years old. And similar result uh, were found using the Massachusetts data. And so that means, that means elderly are much higher risk of um, becoming severe. What that means is they are at higher risk of deaths. And, uh, and also women have a lower risk of becoming severe compared to men. The, using the Wuhan data, the relative risk is about 0.9 and the p-value is also highly significant. This could be due to the reason that there are less women who smoke. So this brings up the take home message number five. So early diagnosis and also the uh, early medical care is critically important. And uh, so the, the early diagnosis and early medical care will help prevent the cases from progressing to become severe cases. And because those severe cases are at much higher risk of deaths, such uh, they are like ARDS cases. And so this is a particularly important for the five vulnerable groups. So now let's look at the, um, our estimate on the around the world. So we use the Hopkins data and uh, to estimate our values and uh, for the uh, uh, for each countries. And so this is estimate our values and across the world. And so the blue indicated those countries with our values are less than 0.5. Then you can see the a few countries and have our value less than 0.5. And so, for example, one of them is is China and also the Korea is also a, a is uh, one uh, one of them, and a few uh, countries like in Europe, for example, like Austria and the New Zealand, and also um, um, New Zealand, and also doing really well. And uh, so, the, a few countries, and you can see that um, uh, right, uh, right uh, many of the countries right now have the R values is more between like 0.8 or uh, 1.2 to 1.5, and. Uh, and uh, so, and uh, there are few countries uh, which our values are greater than two. So I'm going to show you the more detailed result. 
So this is the estimate R curve in America and also in Asia using the March 8 data, up to March 8 data. And so we, uh, so you can see and the, on the left, those we compare the US, Canada, and the Mexico, those in Americas. Then you can see the US and Canada's, the, the curve banded on the, around uh, March, April 15th. And uh, so it's got stuck at, at one. And the Mexico right now, the R value is about 1.5-ish. And uh, so as you know that in the US and the major prevention measure is a social distancing. So this result is very similar to Italy and also to Germany and also to the, the Wuhan result during the lockdown period. So on the right, and this is the um, result and for, um, in, um, uh, in the Asia, those also include uh, China and uh, uh, South Korea. And so you can see the current R value for China is probably about 0.3-ish. And so the Korea been doing really well and for quite a while, but recently it seemed like the number, the, the R curve has been going up, but they all less than one. So Indian, um, the, so the R value has dropped, but still uh, um, uh, uh, bigger than one. So it's about 1.5-ish. So it's important uh, that the effort need to be made to bend the curve. So this is a Europe result to compare a few European countries. So as you can see that Austria is doing really well. And so the current R value is about 1.5-ish. Uh, and also Germany and Italy, they are doing uh, much better. And uh, so their R value is about 0.7-ish. 0 .7, 0 .7 and the UK is similar to US, and the R values have been stuck around one. So this, um, uh, before I talk about the US data, so I want to discuss the take home messages. Number six. So in order to stop outbreak, so multi-faceted uh, approach is needed. It cannot rely on a single measure. So here, it is, um, I emphasize the six pillars. Those include mask wearing, contact tracing, widespread testing, social distancing, isolation and quarantine, and also uh, treat infected cases. So, um, so I had uh, the um, uh, um, opportunities and uh, to um, um, work with a few distinguished colleagues. And uh, so by working, uh, we had one um, New York Times um, op-ed piece that appeared in April, uh, in April. So by working with um, uh, Harvey, uh, a few of us worked together with uh, Harvey Fenberg. And uh, so as you know, like Harvey was a former provost of Harvard and also former president of uh, National Academy of Medicine. And also Jim Young was the former uh, president of um, World Bank. And uh, so Jordan Salen, he was a former health commissioner of San Francisco. And so we, a few of us helped uh, put together this um, uh, op-ed that appeared in uh, New York Times um, in early April. So that emphasized the importance of the uh, contract tracing and, uh, 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 and uh, uh, testing and also isolation and quarantine above the, uh, uh, beyond the social, social distancing. And also, and, um, Dr. Jim Kim has this uh, really beautiful piece um, the, in the New Yorkers on um, the discussing the, the those measures, the importance of those measures, and the, to stop the outbreak. And so the community become more and more um, coming together on the importance of test, trace, and isolate. And so Massachusetts was the first state that launched the contact tracing program and in, uh, in, uh, in um, uh, April. And then the three states, including the Massachusetts and the New York and the New Jersey joined the force. And uh, so then the, so the, on the right, and so this is the picture of WHO president. And that, um, he also emphasized the importance of the uh, test trace and isolate and treat. So now I show you the estimate R values and the, in the US. And so you can see that this is based on uh, data up to uh, May 8. So the uh, majority of the state 
have the R values around one. And uh, so a few states have the R value less than one, especially those states with uh, low population densities. And uh, also there are few states with values um, the, uh, bigger than 1.5. One is, uh, I'll show you some of those states. So the left figure shows a few East Coast um, states, including the Connecticut, Massachusetts, New Jersey, and New York. So as you recall, and uh, so like uh, MA, New Jersey, and New York, they start after the social distancing measure, they started a um, uh, test, trace, and uh, isolate strategies. And so you can see there are values have been um, below one. And so, for example, New York, the R value is probably around 0.75-ish, and Massachusetts, R value is about 0.85-ish. And uh, so, so this, um, this also provide evidence about the we need to um, have multifaceted um, strategies and uh, social distancing is not enough. We need to consider the trace, test, trace, and isolate. On the right, that shows the US um, the Midwest, a uh, few Midwest uh, state, and uh, such as Illinois, Michigan, and Minnesota, and Nebraska. And so the, uh, you can see that uh, Michigan is below, below one, uh, R value is below one right now. So Illinois is a, a, a little above one. And so, the, and also the Minnesota seem like a little uh, above one. And so Nebraska, one uh, reason could be the, the outbreak, the, the values above one, it could be the outbreak and the, in their food processing facilities. Okay, so this shows the uh, West Coast uh, result. So you can see many of the uh, state on the West Coast, and so they are about a little uh, around the one or a little above the one. So the uh, right hand side shows the multiple state result and in the South, and so you can see they are all uh, around one. So it's important to reduce R as much as possible and to help um, Safely open uh, the open the uh, open the open the the the, the, the states. And uh, so um, so this is home take home message number seven. So um, giving right now the testing capacity is still not a uh, high enough, much better than before. So so once you still need to provide a strategy for prior uh, how to prioritize. So then give the priority to the uh, five vulnerable group, especially including those asymptomatic and the pre-symptomatic cases. And so there are a few uh, challenges uh, one face in um, increasing the testing capacity. And the one is the, uh, the supply shortage, in particular the shortage of swaps. And uh, so um, the second is the, uh, the past price, uh, past um, priorities focus on symptomatic subjects. And so with the increasing testing capacities and consider giving priorities and to the five uh, vulnerable group, especially those who are asymptomatic and also who are pre-symptomatic. So using the Wuhan data, we estimated that 60% um, of the at least more than 60% of the daily new cases were ununcertained. So those include the asymptomatic cases, pre-symptomatic cases, and also mild cases. Because the data we analyzed was only in the uncertained cases. And so those are the, the, the lab confirmed cases. So there are two different tests. One is called the PCR test, the other is called the antibody test. These two tests tell us two different things. So PCR tests tell us um, whether the person is currently infected. Antibody tests, and the such including the IgG and IgM, that tell us whether a person was infected before. It does not tell us whether a person is currently infected. Also, if there's no literature, there's no evidence to support that um, if somebody has antibody and that somebody is immune, we don't know that right now. What that means is more research is needed. And uh, also, 
very good sensitivities for antibody tests using ELISA after 20 days of symptom onset, but before 20 days, and so especially after right, within seven days, the sensitivity of antibody tests is uh, likely to be low. So therefore, the antibody test, we need to be pay attention to the accuracy of sens um, sen uh, antibody test, and also if the antibody test give after 20 days <coughs> of the symptom onset, then the sensitiv sensitivity is much better. And also it's useful to conduct serological studies and uh, basically antibody test studies to estimate the population prevalence. So then um, this uh, take home message number eight. So um, why uh, contact tracing is critical and, uh, and can be empowered by integrating uh, humanity and the technology. So for contact tracing, it's very important to protect uh, privacy. And also um, the human manpower is critically important and uh, this cannot be replaced by technology. And so, so like many states right now are learning from Massachusetts contact tracing model because Massachusetts is the first state to start contact tracing. And so as you probably noticed in the news and the multiple tech companies such as Google, Apple, and also um, MIT, so they have been developing advanced uh, contact tracing technology using Bluetooth technologies. And uh, so, so it uh, will be, uh, great if the human manpower and also the technology can be integrated and to ensure the privacy is protected. And also the other issue is the, the, uh, to address the fear of immigrants, especially the uh, underrepresented minorities. So there are um, a lot of fear among them. And uh, so that needs to be addressed uh, using the, for them to using the contact tracing the technologies. And uh, so, Take home next message number eight. And so this is re related to isolation. So it's important to develop a feasible and effective isolation strategies. So, um, so this allows for, uh, allows for uh, both the in-home isolation and also out-of-home isolation strategies. So provide the in-home isolations um, to those who have sufficient good housing conditions and also provide them with a strong uh, social support and medical support and also um, important to develop strategy preventing the household family from being infected. And uh, so, so, and also provide out home, out of home isolation facility for those who need help. And uh, especially those whose housing condition is not good enough. And uh, so for example, those live in the apartment or the low income families and the neighborhood. And also, uh, so you, uh, New York uh, lands a very nice hotel program. They provide the free hotels and to those eligible uh, New Yorkers who need help for isolating in the hotel. And another important issue is to address the fear of immigrants. So this was a very nicely discussed, elaborated in this New York Times articles. And so this article discussed the story of Chelsea. This is a town in Massachusetts, which has the highest risk, uh, highest rate of infection. 60% of the residents are uh, Hispanic. And so even the town, Chelsea provided the free hotels and for the residents and to isolate or quarantine in the hotel, but not many of those hotel rooms were taken because there was a fear of the immigrants and uh, of going there and they were afraid that by going there and uh, they may be separated from their families. So therefore, so in order to really fight for, uh, really fight the, uh, fight the outbreak is more than science and human and public health. And so it involves the, the um, culture, involves the, the uh, legislation, involves the law. So, it, so therefore it really needs to be a joint force. So take home message number nine. So it's important to effectively educate and communicate with the general public. And so this is quickly important to share the gained knowledge and uh, in, an, in an understandable way with the general public to help them make a good decision for themselves, loved ones, and also the communities. 
And also different countries is different. And so one size cannot fit all. So effective implementation of the six control measures must be adopted to each country's own situation and culture. And so those include the public health implementation, healthcare implementation, and also society implement, implementation. So the final uh, take home message is, is, uh, is important to be united. So, um, and Wuhan's experience help us not start from zero. And uh, so it's important to let the data speak and uh, use the data evidence, uh, evidence, uh, use the evidence and the two develop strategies. So if I say a single take home message, I would say unite the community. So everybody is a team member and to contribute and work together. And also it's important to develop multi-stakeholder approaches in involving government, international organizations, academia, business, community, and citizens. And finally, and uh, this work would not be possible and uh, so without the help of many people. So I want to, besides Wuhan colleague, I also want to uh, uh, acknowledge many of my student postdocs and uh, on the, who are listed on the left and also many colleagues and uh, in the How We Feel team. And uh, so they are, for, the one thing I learned um, from um, uh, my last uh, two month um, work is, is really, we really have a wonderful scientific community. So I, I got to know many, many people I did not know before. And so if you look at the list on the right, the how we feel team, it's really a multidisciplinary team. So I knew, I did not know 99% of them. And so before uh, this project, it's really wonderful. So we develop this kind of partnership with expertise. We have the industry support and also expertise and also um, collaboration with many colleagues at the Broad Institute, at the Broad Institute, Harvard, and also across the across many different institutions, and also many people on the on the on this list. And so you can see that uh, they have a very different background. So a lot of people step in to help out. So I'm very grateful for all the help they have provided us. And uh, so thank you. Thank you so much, Ji Hong, for that very thorough and inspiring work. We are very deeply grateful to you. Uh, and as you mentioned that we this sense of solidarity uh, everywhere in the society, in the statistical community, in the scientific community is truly inspiring. And at this time, I think we have all experienced alternative, uh, alternating um, waves of fear and uh, inspiration. And uh, your talk embodied a lot of uh, scientific and pragmatic strategies. So we have lots and lots of questions, uh, 56 questions so far. I tried to really cluster them and Jim is going to help me if I missed any broad topics into some topics. So one thing from a data science point of view uh, is that the testing. So different, the different countries have different testing capacities. And so how do you think about the numbers reported from each country and put them on the same map when they have a different testing strategies and testing capacity, how can we compare? And then even within a country, it is changing across days. So how does the model account for that, that, that testing is really limited and it's growing? So the influence of testing differences within a country and across countries. So uh, how does that affect our estimates? And uh, do we believe this missing data under reporting pattern across the countries and within a country can be ignored? This is really excellent uh, question. And uh, so um, definitely different countries and the uh, different state in US and uh, their testing capacities are different. And uh, so as I mentioned that um, uh, if uh, I, I don't have the US data showed here. So if you look at the US data, you can see that the number of the tests has gone up very quickly in the last few months. But one cannot use the number of positive tests uh, from among those who are were tested to estimate the prevalence. This is going to overestimate the prevalence. And uh, so the reason is, as I mentioned, only the sick people and uh, were uh, tested uh, right now because of the lack of testing capacity. 
And so therefore, in order to really estimate the prevalence, and uh, so it's important to consider the um, asymptomatic and the presymptomatic cases. So that's why in the paper, and uh, we uh, we analyze the uh, confirmed cases. Those are uncertained cases. We also estimate the percentage of um, asymptomatic uh, uh, percentage of uh, uncertain cases. And uh, so those cases were not as, uh, were not observed. And so we use the model to estimate them. And so we did not, um, uh, we did not um, use the percentage of, we did not use the number of people being tested in the model because we don't have that information. And so if the testing capacity increase more and more, then we will be able to see that we will be able to detect the asymptomatic and the uh, presymptomatic cases. And then that will um, make the, uh, that, as, that will provide a better estimate of the prevalence. Thank you, Zhihang. Another question is that you focus a lot on the R0 measure. So there are a lot of questions about two parts to the question. What should be a target value for an R0 when we think that, yes, we are in the control of the outbreak? And the second question is, from a public health point of view, should we look at R0 or the case infection uh, or the infection rate, or should we look at the projections of number of new cases? What should we look at? Uh, or doubling time, several measures, very confusing. So what should we focus on from a public point of view, health point of view? Um, um, right, I think that let me first answer the R0 questions. And uh, to estimate R0, we need external data. And so in particular, we need to, um, we need the incubation period and also infection period. So those are related to zero intervals. And uh, so we use the literature and uh, to uh, uh, calculate those. Uh, we use the uh, the reported value of the incubation period and also the infectious period reported in the literature, and so we use those and to calculate the R value, uh, the R zeros. And so, therefore, the result are uh, depends on what. Uh, incubation period and also what uh, the zero uh, infections period one use. If one use unrealistic values, <laughs> and then the R zero can be very off. Mm -hmm. And secondly, if the number of cases of at the initial stage are not very large, then the R value can be way off and can be very very var variable. And you can get some weird R value over ten. So therefore, the it's, it's important that when one estimates R zeros, and uh, so one has a good ex external information, and uh, so um, and also the number of the cases at the beginning cannot be too small. And uh, so the let me see what is the second question. What is the target value when you think like, you know, in Wuhan it went down to 0 0.32 and now we see many states are plateauing around one. So when should we think that this is a comfortable and the background infection rate is sort of matching with, uh, it's not an outbreak? So one need to reduce R value is, uh, so if you recall the definition of R value, R value is the basically the reproductive member measures the average number of subjects infected by a case. So if R value is one, then what that means is one infected case still infect another. And uh, so that's still not safe. So one need to reduce R value as much as possible. And uh, so below one, so that's why it's important to bend the curve. And so currently, as you recall, and uh, the, uh, as you know, like uh, um, a good number of states uh, have reopened and in US. And uh, so because this is really a challenging issue for all of us, that how to balance the economy and also how to ensure public safety. And uh, so so therefore, uh, one really needs to think carefully. And uh, when one open uh, the state, when the R value is still around the one and uh, where it's not low, much lower than one yet. So in this context, uh, um, so multi-phase, uh, plan is important and also continue social distancing and also contact tracing and um, the the um, um, testing contact tracing and isolation and uh, especially uh, so they are all very important especially contact tracing and also isolation and uh, to avoid the second surge thank you so much Jihan. so there is another question about the strategy of sweden so this has come up in various questions that um, 
Sweden and actually tied to this is that US states which did not go into complete lockdown versus US states which have uh, been in stay at home strict stringent measures. So is that difference that you see in terms of our values, is that substantial? So basically comment on Sweden's strategy and people who have not adopted such stringent measures and what is the influence and impact that you have observed so far? Uh, that's a very good question. This is related to herd immunity. And uh, so, um, uh, as you know, that um, the uh, uh, Sweden uh, did, uh, took a different strategy and uh, they did not um, um, uh, do what uh, the other country uh, uh, did in terms of social distancing. And uh, so in order for the herd immunity to be effective, to fund, uh, to, um, one needed to have at least 50 to 60 percent of the population infected. And uh, so um, what that means is there will be a lot of lots of deaths and there could be millions or tens of millions of people who will die. And uh, so whether uh, this is a really huge price and uh, whether um, one would be one would be willing to pay this price. And uh, so this is uh, this, uh, human lives. And, uh, so, um, uh, yeah, um, so if one compare the Sweden's um, number of infected cases with the neighborhood um, uh, countries such as Denmark, Finland, and uh, Norway, then you can see that uh, Sweden's number of infected cases and also the number of deaths uh, is quite uh, quite a bit higher and, uh, than the than Denmark and uh, uh, Sweden uh, than Denmark and uh, uh, Finland and so it, it definitely it is a challenging issue that how to balance the uh, economy and also well keep the public safe. So overall, I I I don't feel the. Uh, herd immunity is the way to go in order uh, so because uh, saving life is critically important. Thank you, Shi Hong. Uh, then the other question, which is a cluster of questions about model free ways of data dependent, data adaptive ways of computing the R value or assuming a compartmental model versus a segmented Poisson model. So as we think about modeling this data, what are some guiding strategies and uh, what would be your recommendation? in terms of the models that you have used and the models that you have looked at? Uh, yeah, um, that's a good question. Um, there's, um, there's, we look at multiple models. One is the, uh, the third model. So this basically is based on the Poisson regression with the differential equations. And uh, so those um, make uh, various assumptions, as I mentioned, and also when you to specify the differential equation right. And uh, so for the Wuhan data, we use the, um, which we develop uh, the third model, which try to uh, describe the Wuhan situation. For different countries, the situation could be different. So therefore the third model need, need to be modified for different countries. So those models are more parametric. Then the IPST method and is more, um, non-parametric method and uh, so basically it does not assume this kind of parametric differential equation models and but also it make uh, multiple assumptions as well and uh, so um, the, so uh, for example and uh, so we um, the, um, is um, it assume that there is uh, the, the model assume um, there's no um, uh, it, the model, the IP estimate model, does not as, uh, uh, allow for the um, uh, does uh, does not uh, uh, allow for the um, uh, does not estimate the allow for the uh, asymptomatic cases. And uh, so, for the third model, as you recall, we try to model the uh, asymptomatic uh, the uncertain cases, including asymptomatic and presymptomatic cases. And so, therefore, like IPS models, and so make some assumptions. So they are always prime account. This also speaks for the importance of developing new statistical models to address those concerns, uh, to address those issues. Thank you so much, Shihong. Uh, so another question uh, which is coming up repetitively is that how do you come up with a model which actually uh, takes the effectiveness of individual interventions from a public health point of view, 
but also tries to minimize economic harm. So is there a cost benefit paradigm where the epidemiologic model forecasting feeds into an input, but it's taken into account of all other things, excess deaths, jobs lost. So have you seen any efforts which connects economics and public health together? This is outstanding question. I wish a statistician can develop such a model. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, this definitely is very important. The cost benefit analysis is critically important. Yeah. Uh, Could I jump in here? Uh, from sure, the, sure. There was a question earlier about whether Germany and Italy used uh, centralized quarantine systems to uh, bring their uh, infection rate down. Uh, I, I, that part, I don't know whether they use the centralized quarantine. I thought they just used the social distancing. I think at least for, if you look at the Italy, um, Italy at least before April, uh, April 16, and uh, so the Italy only used the central. So if you look at this curve, and the Italy before April 16, the Italy only used the social distancing. I, I don't think they use uh, centralized uh, quarantine or isolation. Maybe, the, I think, but if you look at the current Italy data and the curve banded more, so maybe after April 16, they started the new measure. And uh, so I'm not very familiar with that. So somebody more familiar with that probably will, uh, will can say more about this. Yeah. So in, in Germany, I, uh, I, I don't know whether they use the, um, the if you look at the before, April 6 and look like the curve was uh, still stuck at one. But after April 6, they seem like the curve is uh, better. So maybe they implemented additional measure is possible. And uh, so I, 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 it would be good to hear if they started this um, uh, isolation, uh, isolation strategy. Yeah, so you can see like you can see the Germany and Italy by looking at the May 8th data, they are much better. Right. Uh, as we go forward, uh, Shi Hong, uh, do you have a recommendation for which app people might want to use to uh, do this contact tracing? Oh, the uh, contact tracing. Um, right now, I think uh, like the um, uh, a few uh, a few states started this. So, so Massachusetts was the first one. I think the uh, New Jersey and uh, New York and uh, um, uh, uh, so are have started. Uh, uh, there, there uh, as well. And uh, so for Massachusetts uh, right now, they mainly man manpower. So as I mentioned, uh, this, is, uh, this is a complicated issue. It is um, one needed to have um, protect the privacy and also address the uh, con concerns uh, of the fears of um, immigrants. So basically Massachusetts hired about over a thousand um, uh, contact tracers. So my colleague at um, uh, Partner Health, and, um, uh, Joya Mukherjee, she has really done a fabulous job in leading this effort. And uh, so I, I don't think the um, Apple or um, Google's uh, MIT app has been used so far, but there are lots of current, uh, lots of moving target right now. So, so therefore, and uh, so those, um, how can one incorporate the uh, integrate the manpower uh, with basically the humanity uh, contact tracing plus the technology to come up with a contact tracing strategy that can protect the privacies and also address the issues of the fears. So yeah, so I think uh, I'm sure some strategy will come up in the future. I know the app, uh, the Google app has already been launched and the contact tracing app has uh, already been launched, yeah. So I think the app is really cool. I think the, the, the idea is using the Bluetooth and the, the idea is really cool. So basically uh, let's protect the privacy in a way that you don't know who, just basically if you got a message saying basically through the connection of the Bluetooth and say, well, they tell you that um, there is somebody who's, uh, who was infected, uh, this is within like 30 meter of you, if that person reported turn on the, their Bluetooth uh, app. And um, so, but without knowing who that person is. So there is some privacy uh, protected over there. Yeah, but I think that each issue is, a lot, there are concerns about the, the, the fears of the immigrants and the, especially underrepresented minorities. And the, so those issues need to be addressed in order for those technology to be widely used. It's wonderful technology. 
So Shi Hong, there are two couple of other questions. One is about predicting the second peak or the third peak. So do you think those uh, forecasting about the peaks coming in fall, uh, those are reliable and how reliable are these epidemiologic models for long-term forecasting and in terms of uh, when is the next peak is going to resurge? Uh, I think this really depends on the, what is a, a what is a, uh, what will happen in the next few months. And uh, so, you know, like some states have already uh, reopened and some states have not. For example, like uh, Massachusetts has a four-phase uh, plan and uh, then um, Illinois also has a four-phase plan. And uh, so, it, it, so it really depends on what uh, measures and will be used to ensure public safety. And uh, so, um, so basically uh, reopen it gradually and uh, then uh, well it uh, depends on how the so first i would say like for the reopening strategy one is that it, it's important to consider the uh, phases multiple phases and the second is it's important to develop a uh, implementation strategy for those six um, the six, uh, six pillars I mentioned. And uh, then the bump, whether the re research um, the will depends on how those measures are implemented after the reopen. So uh, hopefully given before, before, uh, before April, as, as you, before April, and so the, the R values have been quite high. And uh, because many of the social distancing uh, stay-at-home orders and uh, were issued uh, in late uh, in late uh, in late March, and so even with, uh, with right now, because there are much more awareness of social distancing and also much more awareness of the testing, um, contact tracing, and also isolation. So with all those awareness and also all those effort, so. Um, one would expect if there is a research, hopefully this research will be the small bump, not the uh, big bump. And, uh, but definitely one need to be very careful with all those uh, six measures in order to avoid having a big bump. Thank you. There is another question about the household modeling and isolation of an individual from the household. So mm -hmm. two parts to this question. One is how do you account for household size when you do these models? And the second question is that there have been some literature which shows that uh, there is no additional effect of quarantine removed from a household beyond the social distancing measures in Wuhan. Can you comment on that and how do you quantify those differences? Uh, in our model, we did not model the, um, we did not model the household size because we did not use any household information because in the Wuhan data, when we estimate our value, we only use the number of the uh, daily number of uh, uh, confirmed cases. So there's no information in that data about the uh, household transmission. And uh, so in order to estimate the household transmission, additional data is uh, needed. So for example, like uh, uh, if uh, one can use a contact tracing data, that can be used to estimate the uh, household trans transmission. And also the also we use the how we feel data from how we feel survey and we uh, we ask whether if a person is infected, test has a positive test. We ask whether the 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 case had anybody in the household who was infected. So we need additional data to estimate the household transmission rate. And so we did not use those and uh, to in in the Wuhan model fitting. And so in terms of what is the second question? So uh, so. There is a paper that different way to compute an effective R uh, does not show an additional effect of quarantine removed from a household beyond the social distancing measures in Wuhan. Uh, can you comment on that? Oh, I, I don't know that paper. I cannot answer that question. Okay. Yeah. Um, fair enough. So I think we are coming to uh, the end of the time. So there is one last question is that if you, you focused on how do we, how should we focus as a strategy? So obviously for the asymptomatic people, I think testing is the strategy, For the mm -hmm. symptomatic people, isolation and quarantine is a strategy. And when we are thinking about finite resources, how should we focus, prioritize in terms of the focusing on the asymptomatic cases or symptomatic cases? And are there any advantages if you're detected early, are there known medical interventions that will help you not progress to the most severe form. 
So are there any kind of preventions that are known from the Wuhan data for early detected cases, what they can do in order to not progress to very severe or that's largely unknown? Um, so the so let me answer the question about the treat, early treatment first. And uh, so um, so the um, the early treatment and early diagnosis is important. And so in Wuhan, so for example, the, um, so the, the, some of them are were giving the supportive treatment. I think right now in U.S. many of the, the mouth cases were giving supportive treatment, and in Wuhan they were also giving the 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 uh, the, the herb medicine as well. And so, so there were some. Uh, um, uh, I don't think there's a study has been done that, but uh, based on what I heard, it seemed like some of the herb medicine were helpful on the, for the early treatment. And uh, so uh, it would be nice if some kind of formal study can be done. And uh, the second question is about how to handle the asymptomatic and pre-symptomatic cases. And uh, so uh, ideally, it would be good that everybody's tested, right? But this is very expensive and uh, everybody's tested. So therefore, we need to think about uh, the strategy to identify asymptomatic and pre-symptomatic cases. And because pre-symptomatic cases are uh, still infectious, kids infect others. And uh, so one possibility is to do the contact tracing. So therefore, do contact tracing, and so if the close contact can be identified, and then they can give priorities and to be tested. And also those vulnerable groups, as I mentioned, are those six vulnerable, vulnerable groups, and then they can be given priority to be tested. And also with now, and so with more people going back to work, and so especially for the state with multiple phases on the, of opening, um, uh, opening plans. And uh, so for those people who go back to work early, especially like essential workers, and then they can be provided opportunity to be tested early. That yeah, those will help as well. Yeah. Thank you so much, Shi Hong. I know that uh, the questions are exponentially growing, uh, but our time is limited. So we'll con conclude this session and I'll hand it over to Jim for his concluding remarks. There's a lot of uh, interest in getting the reference to the papers. So we will definitely put a link to your uh, JAMA paper on the COPS website. But I'd really like to thank NIS and COPS. And you showed an example of people coming together to do science when we are physically distanced. And you still built a team where most of the people were unknown. They just came together for the same cause. So thank you. We are deeply grateful as a community for your inspiring and exceptional work. So over to Jim. Thank you. Um, thank you, Brahma. And thank you, Shihang. This has been very useful. and. Uh, let me say for the audience, the, uh, the video and the slides will be put on our website, at uh, the NIST website under news. And we will definitely try to make this available to the policy, uh, policy makers. Uh, you had so many, many helpful suggestions as part of the talk. So it's truly a case where science can inform society behavior. And uh, thank you again. And, Thank you both. And with that, we will conclude this session. Thank you very much. Thank you to everyone who joined. Thank you. Bye. Bye.